Okay, we'll uh, get started. Okay, uh, before we start, is there any questions about the assignments? Okay, hopefully you had a chance to look through it. Yeah. No, I'm not sure. I, there might be a slight mistake in the assignment, but the idea is you pick one or of the two. Yeah. You can do both if you really wanted to, like, say, do the same core task on both of them. It's, I'm flexible, but uh, the, the vision was that you would just choose one of them and do it. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. All right, so we're going to shift gears again. Uh, so this uh, time we're going to talk about policy. So that will be the last three lectures. Um, so I'm going to, today's class will be on sort of non-technical policies, just to get an idea of what policies are. And then uh, the next two lectures will be on a more technical version of a policy. So cookie policies, which is relevant to your assignment, and uh, the uh, same origin policy, which is something that's in browsers. But today we'll talk about something more fun, hopefully. OK. So uh, OK, so policy is basically like a rule. Uh, but usually it's a rule that's put there by a human or it was it's designed for humans to use, OK? Um, so even software code. Uh, has policies that are baked into it, like you get a cookie, what should you do with it? That's a policy. Uh, but there's also lots of policies, procedures, and things like that uh, that are like in outside organizations and things like that. And they're also critical for security uh, because if you can sidestep the policy, then you might be able to sidestep a, a security goal. So in particular, if we go all the way back to Stride, uh, Breaking a policy tends to look like the E in stride, so escalation of privilege. So the policy will dictate whether you have privilege to do something, whether you're authorized to have access, and then if you can find a way around it uh, because there's a mistake in the policy itself, then you'll be able to do things that you aren't privileged uh, to do. And uh, we've seen lots of examples already. We didn't necessarily call it a, a policy breach. Uh, but we've seen examples already in, in class. Um, so one was when we talked about social engineering, you'll remember that Amazon, uh, if, if you want to reset your password, it's going to ask you a lot of questions about who you are. If you want to add a credit card to your account, it's going to less, ask you less questions. Okay. So the adversary was able to do that, add a credit card, and then use that, the fact that there was now a credit card, and the adversary knew the credit card information uh, to reset the password. So that was an error in the policy or procedures of Amazon that allowed that attack. Uh, we saw that if you want to get a, 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 an SSL certificate, an HTTPS certificate, then you have to prove that you own the domain. And so a CA will have a policy like, we're going to send an email to a min at your domain.ca. And if you can answer it or click on something that's in that email, uh, then we're going to believe that you control the domain. Then we'll give you a certificate for your domain. So that the idea of using email is a policy or a procedure. And then uh, policy flaws can also be like, it, it might be the entire attack or it might be just like a sort of smaller uh, subcomponent of an attack. Now, the, it's sort of the same, the reason this is in this course is kind of the same for social engineering and usability and maybe a little less about usability, but um, uh, first off, it's in the course because it tends to fall through the cracks. Okay, so you take 6, 1, 10, 20, 30, 40, you're probably not going to talk about policies or procedures. You might talk about them without pointing them out. So I know, for example, the same origin policy would be covered in a networking class, but you're not thinking about it from a policy perspective. You're thinking about it more just in terms of what attacks are possible and things like that. Um, but we're, so, so some of that, the last two lectures might review the networking course, but we'll be looking at it from a different angle. We'll be thinking, well, why is the policy what it is and why does the policy lead to, you know, attacks like, for example, a cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgery, that, that type of thing. 
Um, and the other thing about policies is that there's no good methodology. Okay, so like social engineering, how do you, you write down a policy? Is it good? Is there flaws? You work at Amazon and someone shows you the policy, which is that anyone can add a credit card without authentication. How do you catch that, that there's an attack there, right? And so what's the methodology that you go through? That's what this class is about. And again, there's no real good methodology. So at the end of the next three lectures, I'll tell you a bit about what some of the methodologies are. But this will be more like social engineering, where it's less about giving you the methodology. It's more about exposing you to what the problems are so you can think about why it's difficult uh, in order to, to try and make sure that your policies and procedures are, don't have security flaws. Okay, so I'll give you a couple quick examples, and then uh, we'll go through a longer example, which is airport security. And then uh, in the next two classes, we'll cover cookie policies, and then we'll cover the same origin policy. Uh, and so it'll be one lecture on, on each of those. Okay, so here's some quick examples just to get a feel for what, what's a policy and a procedure as opposed to something else. So one thing that, that's often labeled a policy is a password policy that a website will have if you're registering or resetting your password for the website, they'll have some rules about what password you can use, okay? So rules might include that you need at least so many characters, eight characters, 10 characters. Uh, it might have like sort of, uh, like you, you have to have a capital letter, you have to have a small letter, you have to have a number, you have to have a special character, that type of thing. Uh, so that would be considered a policy. Um, another thing that, that's actually a, a, probably be a better approach than the, the two things that I mentioned uh, is uh, the website might have a list of leaked passwords or what are the most common passwords that people set and it's a deny list and if you try and set exactly one of those passwords then it will say that you can't use that particular password itself. Uh, websites have privacy policies uh, whether you read them or not, I don't know. Cookie policies also now, you see that a lot more, even Concordia, uh, there's been some changes at the government level uh, that have dictated uh, that, you know, businesses in Quebec uh, need to uh, display a cookie policy and it, it's structured in a certain way and so you can choose like the exact policy you want. Privacy policies are related, terms of services is another uh, policy. So those are the three kinds of policies you might see on a website. Um, here's, here's another thing. So uh, this is an example uh, of something that, um, I don't know if I call it an attack, but people were not particularly happy about. Um, so Facebook at one point said, okay, you have to use two-factor authentication uh, to log in, or they really pushed two-factor. It was very hard to not set up an account without two-factor authentication. And the two-factor authentication originally was your phone number. So you basically had to, to put a phone number in. Then what Facebook did is because they had everyone's phone number is they use that as part of like the information they have on you when they resell it to other people, then they can include the phone number. Uh, people got advertisements and things like that, like spam calls and things like that uh, through their phone number that was leaked, wasn't leaked, but you had to give it. So the, the policy of we need two-factor authentication, therefore we need your phone number, right? That's a policy decision. But then it, the, the consequence of that is now uh, services have everyone's phone numbers, right? Which they didn't necessarily have before. The other thing too is you know it works. So lots of websites will say, what's your phone number? You can type any phone number in, right? But here, if you can't answer the code, like they'll, they'll ping it and make sure that you can answer it. So now they know that's actually your phone number or something close to it. It's a, it's a phone that you have access to anyways, uh, whether it's strictly yours or not, but it's not just some like made up number. Um, another thing is uh, Apple's, uh, so this was something else that was in the news that was announced recently. Uh, so uh, in Apple's operating system on the iPhone, uh, if you take a picture, there's an app uh, that stores the picture it called photos and they ran some machine learning algorithms and they were looking for like illicit images uh, that, that you shouldn't uh, be able to send and then if there was a match uh, then it wouldn't let you save it it would kind of phone home with i forget if it gave the image itself or a hash of the image or that type of thing uh, it might alert law enforcement so probably the biggest category would be something like child pornography and so the problem though was that people would serve, so for example, let's say my son was sick 
and I want to send a picture to my doctor because he had a rash, right? Then the machine learning might say, oh, that looks like child pornography. And so then it would flag it. And then all of a sudden, I don't know, I have law enforcement like at my door or something like that uh, as a result. So uh, this was controversial. I don't know exactly where it came down. So I know that Apple put the technology in the phone and I don't, and, and then there was a big debate in the media about, you know, what, what should happen in, in these cases and things like that. So I don't, I didn't follow up with what the actual resolution was. So I, I, I can't tell you that. But anyway, this is where there's a sort of war over policies. Everyone wants safety for children, right? Like there's, there's no question about that, right? But you also don't want false positives. You don't want uh, people being falsely accused of crimes as well. You don't want to waste law enforcement resources on things that aren't uh, actually crimes. Um, so, so that's where you, you have a very tough policy that you have to try and write down that's going to like uh, keep everyone happy. Um, sorry. Okay, another thing is, uh, so this actually happened in real life, is uh, there was a, a, I think it was a phone company like AT&T, and they basically, they had a URL that looked like this. So someone clicked on their bill and they saw a URL that looked more or less like this. It was just sort of, um, it had the URL, it had a string, so default.asp is some sort of server side uh, script that's running. And then the thing after the question mark is the query that you send to it, okay? And what the person thought is, hey, if I change that 741, which is my account number, to 742, what happens, right? And so they did it. And then all of a sudden, someone else's bill was there, right? So the, the website was like coded in a very poor way. And so they wrote a quick little script, uh, basically, to go through all the bills. And then I think they downloaded or scraped the information or something like that. And then they actually got charged. So AT&T noticed on their server logs. And they, uh, I believe they went to prison for it. And it was also controversial because, you know, you, you, these are public URLs, right? But from the court's perspective, it looked like hacking by just you know manipulating these URLs by changing the number, and because the person had written a script explicitly to do it, then it you know they were charged with with hacking. And another thing is uh, um, this shows up a lot uh, is uh, you now have a lot of cloud computing, so companies will um, will not host their own servers; they'll they'll use Amazon Cloud or whatever, and so. Um, Amazon will give them a physical machine. So their, their process is running on some physical machine. And uh, Amazon has to decide, okay, what else are they going to run on that same machine? So assuming that the, my cloud services don't utilize 100% of, um, of that resource, uh, then some other process is going to be running on it. That means we're going to be sharing some resources, like the cache and things like that. It also opens us up to attack. And if it's my competitor that I'm co-located with, that's very different than if it's just some random, you know, other company that has nothing to do with my industry, right? And so uh, cloud providers might come up with policies like, okay, these people are allowed to, to cohabit uh, a particular server and these ones aren't, uh, that type of thing. Uh, another thing that's, that's in the news, you hear about it every now and then, is called swatting. Uh, so swatting is, uh, if I'm really, angry at someone and I, I want to attack them, I'll call the police, pretend that there's some crime that's happening at that person's address, and uh, I'll make it sound like it's very urgent and it's violent and it requires, like, not just a police officer to show up, but what's called the SWAT team, which is the police officer with, like, military gear and bulletproof vests and big guns and things like that. Uh, they'll go into the house. Uh, there have been occasions where because everyone is surprised and things like that, where there have been accidents and people have gotten shot and things like that uh, as a result of it, okay? Now, that's a policy. So from the police perspective, what are they supposed to do, right? They're, they can't just say, well, maybe that's a prank call, maybe that's not real or not. Like, do, do they wanna be in the position of trying to decide that? Because what if it is a real crime and they don't respond? Right? So this is an abuse of policies and procedures. Police will respond. It's what everyone wants to happen when there's true crimes. And they don't have a way of discerning whether a crime is actually true or whether it's made up. Uh, and so this is an abuse of procedure, uh, essentially. Uh, another thing uh, that came out uh, a couple years ago, 
I mean, they sort of always existed, but Apple was a big brand and they did it, uh, is they have these uh, little trackers uh, called AirTags. I have one in my bag, but I, I won't pull it out. But it's just like a little, looks like a coin, uh, basically. And uh, you can put it on your device, put it on your keys, put it in your bag, whatever the case is. Uh, and then if you lose it, then it will geolocate it. Doesn't have a GPS, it just will talk to basically every other iPhone that comes in proximity of it. And then those phones have GPSs. And so they'll relay the information of where the tag is. So if the tag's out in the middle of nowhere and there's no phones around, it won't work. But generally, almost everywhere you go, there's someone you know walking by at least every, every now and then with a phone. Um, now, of course, what people did uh, is uh, you have stalkers who would put it on someone that they want to follow or they want to know where someone lived, so they would slip it in their bag or they would see their car, they would put it on their car, uh, that type of thing. So it made that uh, very easy. Again, this wasn't new technology, like you could always do GPS trackers and things like that, but these are pretty cheap. Uh, like they're maybe like you get three for a hundred dollars kind of thing. Uh, and they're very small and they, they work very well because they don't have a GPS, they can be so small. And because they're leveraging Apple's own infrastructure of phones, right? Like I don't have a choice if, if you have an AirTag and it's talking to my phone, like that's happening behind my back. I can't turn that off, right? I have a phone, you have an AirTag, and so Apple allows that, that to happen or whatever, right? So then what Apple did is they um, would do things like if they noticed that there was, first off, every tracker has to be a, a affiliated with an Apple account. So let's say that you're going somewhere and you have your phone. So it's like, I see your phone you know, going to your house and I see this other AirTag and it's going with you. So everywhere your phone goes, this other AirTag goes to you, but that AirTag's not registered to your phone account. It's to some other account. Uh, then what it will do is it will warn you on your phone. It looks like there's an AirTag that's following you around, uh, basically that's, that's not yours. Uh, and then you have the option of stop talking to it or I, I don't know exactly what all the options are that they, they give you. Um, this, is the, this is what the uh, warning looks like. So anyways, so anyway, that, that was another thing where it was a policy. So originally the AirTags came out, they didn't have this. Then people fought back and said that this is making stocking very easy, you need to do something. And then this was the response from Apple. Some people thought it was adequate, some people think that it doesn't go far enough. And so it's still a, a debate that's being had. Yep, yep. So in that case, because you stole it, you'll know it, so you'll ignore the, the, the. Um, you'll ignore it. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you, then you'll know that that person has an AirTag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that's, that's sort of the flip side, I guess, of it is that, um, yeah. If I steal a bag and I don't know that there's an AirTag there, then because I get the anti-soccer warning, it alerts me to that there is an AirTag. Then I'll go find the AirTag and get rid of it, and then it makes it easier for me to steal and not get caught. Okay, so uh, another example comes from this paper. So this is a, a, a nice paper that's on the Moodle. Uh, you can look into it if, if you want. Um, is uh, they, they study a whole bunch of things around security policies, uh, but one thing they look at is what's called SIM swapping. Um, so swim, SIM swapping is basically, uh, trying to remember what slides I have about it. Okay, I'll just, I'll just explain it. I don't know if I have a diagram. Um, Okay, so I have a phone number, whatever, 514-473 something, 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 okay? And that phone number is in my phone. So if you call that phone number, my phone is gonna ring, okay? So the, how does that happen? How does that phone number somehow get into my physical device? And so the answer is there's a sort of middle piece of information which is called your SIM, okay? So when uh, someone dials that number, they figure out, oh, you're with Bell, then they go to Bell and Bell will say, okay, I have this number and I have this SIM number and the SIM number is the number that you should ring, okay? The SIM number is on a card. Now it's like digital, but it used to be like an actual like card that you could pull out of your phone. You might've done it. Um, and you can put it into another one. And, uh, and uh, anyways, you put the SIM into your phone. So now 
your SIM, your phone only knows about your SIM, essentially. The phone agency knows about the phone number to SIM. And so I call a number, it gets translated to a SIM number, then my phone rings because my number has that SIM number, okay? Now, let's say you want to change your phone number. Okay, that's allowed. You can do that. Maybe even in Canada, if you want to switch from Bell to Rogers or Videotron or something because they have better rates, you're allowed to take your phone number with you uh, because if you weren't, then people wouldn't switch because it's so awkward to like have to change your phone number with all of your friends and things like that. Uh, so there's a new law that says, and then companies would use it to sort of lock you in. They knew that you're not going to switch phone numbers, and so then they wouldn't give you good rates and things like that. So you, you're legally entitled to move it. So what that means is that this mapping between SIM numbers and phone numbers is malleable. It can be changed. Okay. How do you change it? Well, you call up Bell or whoever and say you want it changed. Okay. Now, they're not going to change it if you're not the person that owns that phone number or that SIM number. Okay. But if you're able to use social engineering or something like that, uh, then you could get that switched. Now, what's the consequence of it getting switched? It's I can basically hijack your phone. Okay. And so that might be bad enough for like getting access to your calls, uh, to text messages in the future. But where it really breaks things down is with things like two-factor authentication. So let's say I have a keystroke logger, I have your password, I don't have two-factor for you. Then I do SIM swapping attack and then I get your phone number. Now I have your second factor and now I can log in as you. So um, anyways, what they did in this paper is they, uh, they basically tried to SIM swap attack their own phone number with lots of different carriers. So they phoned them all up, they tried to do the attack on themselves and then they recorded whether the person on the phone ultimately uh, would, would allow them to do it. And when I say they attack, they, they pretend that they're not, like they pretend to be the person they actually are, but they only tell them information that an attacker would know, uh, that type of thing. And so they found that 39 of their uh, 50 attempts uh, succeeded. Um, and so uh, what would happen is basically you phone them up and they say, okay, you have to prove who you are. So what's your name? Uh, you know, what's your address? This is all easily obtainable things. And then they had some weird challenge questions. So like, for example, one challenge question they had is, um, what are the last three phone calls you received? Okay, if this is truly your phone number and your phone, uh, then you should know, you know, who the last three people are that called you, tell, tell us this information. Okay, now this turns out to be a bad policy. Can anyone think about why this is bad? What can an attacker do? Okay, so the attacker can phone you three times, right? Then call the phone company and they'll say, what were the last three calls? And he'll say like his own number or whatever, right? Um, so anyway, there, there's uh, things like that. Yeah, you can use several different phones so that the, the numbers look uh, different. <coughs> but the attacker knows this information because the attacker set that information. Sorry, I have a bit of a cough. Anyways, this is actually very similar to that at mad example, right? It's like, I don't know a piece of information, like I don't know that credit card number, but if I can set it myself, then I know it, right? And so it's the same thing. I don't actually know who called you the last three times, but if I call you three times in a row, then I do know because I, I made that information. So the, um, the sort of flaw is that uh, if you ask about personal private data that is adversarially controlled, in other words, the adversary has control over that data in some circumstances, um, then you can't, you can't base a policy uh, on that. Okay, now this is something you could technically find out. If you modeled your whole policy, um, any value that the adversary could control, you can do what's called taint analysis, so you taint it, and then eventually you see that it comes through in this policy. So the policy is asking about the last three calls, but you've tainted that as something the adversary can control. And so that you might have a chance of recognizing uh, that there's a, a flaw in this policy. <coughs> um, there, there's also a sort of related thing where uh, eventually, sometimes people give up their SIM numbers or they, they give up their phone number. Um, so the phone takes back the SIM and then eventually it gets recycled, okay? So they give it out to a new customer. Uh, and then once a new customer gets it, then they start getting like random, like two-factor authentications for the previous person that held that uh, SIM number. And they see that kind of thing. 
Okay, so anyways, there's lots and lots of uh, attacks that are related to SIM swapping or SIM swapping was some sort of component. Um, I work a lot on cryptocurrencies and so there, there's lots of Bitcoin that's been stolen, millions of dollars. Uh, just use, as you see in the middle title, hackers have stolen millions of dollars in Bitcoin using only phone numbers. Uh, and it's all because of basically two-factor authentication and SIM swapping. Or password resets, that's the other thing. So you might say, I don't know my password. And they'll say, no problem, we'll send a text message to your number. So then you don't even need the password, you just need the phone number. So if you get the phone number, then that's, that's all you need, then you reset the password. Uh, here's another interesting example that was in the news. So this is, uh, the, the title is The Life Upending Flaw That the USPS Won't Fix. Does anyone know what USPS is? Okay, so it's a post office. It's like Canada Post, but in the United States. <coughs> Sorry, I guess it says the answer right there too. Um, okay, so another thing you can do is you can move, obviously, move houses, and you have to change your address, okay? And so you can have mail forwarded from one address to another address. And uh, in order to request mail forwarding, you basically just have to fill out a form. So you say, this is my old address, this is my new address, uh, I want my mail forwarded, okay? Now, obviously you could hijack someone's mail if there was like no authentication or anything like that, okay? So what, what does, what's the policy, the security policy for making sure the person requesting the mail, the address change, uh, is the actual person, okay? So what the U.S. Postal Service does not do is they don't authenticate when you submit the form. So anyone can submit the form. You don't have to show ID. So you can at least try to set up mail forwarding for something that's not yours. And you're not gonna get caught at that stage. Then what they'll do is they'll uh, send two postcards in the mail. One will go to the old address, one will go to the new address. And they'll say basically somebody wants to do this mail forwarding, do you agree or do you not agree? Okay. And uh, um, the policy is what we call, we, we actually saw an example of the opposite deny override, or sorry, we actually we saw an example of allow override, but I'll get there in a second. Um, okay, so you, you mail these two postcards and you're basically going to say, okay, someone's trying to do this, uh, do you want to allow it or not allow it? Okay, so the person can say yes, and then it will be allowed. They can say no, then it won't be allowed. Or there's a third option, which is they say nothing at all, okay? Now, every policy has to decide what are you going to do when someone does nothing at all, right? My son wants to tell you something. Yay. Okay, so you don't get a response back, okay? then you have to decide what's the default behavior. The default behavior from a security perspective should be you deny it, right? So that's called deny override. Um, but from a usability perspective, right, you often want, you want it to, to happen for the user. And so you might have an allow override policy, okay? So this policy happens to be allow override. So what that means is if you get the postcard it's telling you that your mail is about to be redirected and you don't answer and you don't say don't do that, then it will happen. Okay, eventually in two weeks or something like that. Okay, so where have we seen over allow override already? We saw it with revoca revocation with certificates, right? We would ask the server, is this revoked? And if they said nothing at all, we would assume, okay, it's okay. Okay, so that's another example of allow override. Okay, so the attack is that you set this up uh, and then when the mail card goes, you can just cross your fingers and hope they don't see it or they get too much mail or it gets lost or something like that. Or you could actively try and get rid of that postcard, okay? And that's a lot easier of an attack, right? All you have to do is, you know, when the mailman or mail person uh, drops the mail off, you just go there, go through it real quick, you pull out the postcard or whatever, throw it away, and then you're done. Right now you've hijacked their mail, eventually it will kick in. 
And so this is a, uh, an example from the article itself. It says, in a particularly comical case from 2017, an Atlanta resident was arrested for cashing checks that he had rerouted from the corporate headquarters of UPS itself, uh, resulting in literal bathtubs of mail piling up outside the hapless fraudster's apartment. Uh, yet it took nearly three months for UPS to notice that its mail wasn't showing up. So they just tried the attack for fun. They, they attacked UPS, uh, and then they just got so much mail that they couldn't do anything with it. Uh, and then they eventually got caught, and UPS themselves didn't notice for like three months. And then in the meantime, they were getting all sorts of like paychecks and things like that, and they were uh, cashing them. Okay, so to fix this from a policy perspective, you could do the ID check when you submit the form. So then that would, that would help. And then you could also do a deny override, uh, which basically means if you don't hear back, you assume not to do the mail forwarding. Um, and, uh, you know, and so if it's legitimate and you control both of those mailboxes, the old one and the new, you can get both of those postcards and then there could be like a code on them that you have to type into a website or something like that to prove uh, that it's okay. Okay. So anyway, these are uh, some quick examples of uh, policies just to give you a kind of flavor for the kinds of things that we're talking about. Um, so now we're going to go through a longer example. Uh, so we're going to talk about airport security. Uh, so airports are something that I'm assuming everyone here uh, has gone through at some point in your life. Maybe you, you do it a lot. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of think about it uh, together. Okay. So. There's a lot of different aspects to security. Usually when you think of airport security, you think of the step where you go through the metal detector, right? And so that will be part of this. We will talk about that step. But actually there's a lot of security that happens before that, and there's a lot of security that happens after that as well. So what, where do you think it starts? Where, where's the first like sort of security policy? Where does security kick in uh, when you wanna fly somewhere? What, what would be the very first place that you would see some security? Okay, so that's exactly correct. So it actually happens when you start, right at the very start, when you just purchase uh, the ticket itself. Okay, so I go and I uh, purchase a ticket. And uh, so I get a ticket in my name. I decide I can't fly. Can I give it to you? Yeah, No, why not? Okay, okay. So the ticket is issued in a name. It has to match the idea that it's issued to. Um, did someone check my passport then to, to check to book a ticket? Okay, so I could book a ticket in someone else's name, right? But then I guess I'll get in trouble later when I try and fly. That's more or less the idea. Okay, so the flow kind of is, um, I have some idea I'm asserting at this point. I'm asserting to be Jeremy Clark or Alice is asserting to be Alice. She sends money. Uh, she might book directly with, say, Air Canada. She might go through Expedia. Uh, so let's say she goes through Expedia. Expedia will forward the ID to Air Canada, and then Air Canada will send back a confirmation. Okay? Uh, so you, I go to Expedia. I type in my credit card number. I hit pay, and then it says, uh, and then I get a receipt, and it says, okay, uh, everything's good. Um, uh, we got your payment. Uh, Am I then ready to fly? Do I now have the ticket in hand yeah. at the end of that stage? I so you say it louder. Tur try and talk over top of him. When the sorry. The, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so there's also visas and uh, whether you can access. So just set that aside. Set aside the immigration set. Uh, let's say you're flying domestically within your own country, and that, that, at that point is it done as soon as you pay for it? Okay, I wouldn't be asking if the answer was yes, so no. But uh, what, what's missing? Okay, so there are some checks uh, that are going to happen, okay? Namely, what the government is going to do is they're going to check. They maintain what's called a no-fly list. It's, you don't have instance access, okay? So this is why, like, on Expedia, sometimes you'll book a ticket, you'll get a receipt for the payment, and then maybe, like, a couple hours later or a couple days later, they'll be like, okay, it's confirmed. Here's a confirmation of it uh, because it's waiting uh, for this, this sort of check uh, to happen. 
Okay. And so basically what will happen is the ID will get forwarded to the government. The government will check it against the no fly list. Okay. Now, if you can't fly until that check is done. Okay. But you can book tickets like day of and things like that. Um, so let's say you are on the no fly list. You might not know it at this stage. You might actually be able to buy the ticket and it won't be until you show up to the airport. That's when you'll learn that you're not allowed to fly. Sometimes you, you might learn before you go to the airport, sometimes you don't, okay? Um, but, but anyways, there is a sort of background check uh, that, that's also uh, being checked. Okay, and then the, the government will say, okay, you're allowed to fly, you're not allowed to fly, uh, and then and that can get pushed. Okay, who's on the no-fly list? Okay. So a lot of it's, yeah, people that have committed crimes, uh, usually terrorism is the main thing. It's the main thing uh, that's addressed. Um, what exactly is on the list? Like, is it just a name? Is it a passport? Is it like, what, what exactly is it? Okay, so let's say like two people had the same name. One person's on the no-fly list, the other person's okay. Yeah, so if there's a passport or biometric or something like that, then you could, it would be a specific person, right? It wouldn't be just a name, it'd be a specific person. If, 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 okay, what happens in real life is, uh, oh, actually, okay, I, I'll come back to that in a sec. Just keep that in the, the back of your mind. Okay, now when you purchase your ticket, uh, you also get this thing that's called the PNR. So it's just like six character code you've probably seen it on your boarding passes and things like that when you uh let's say you want to like log into your flight and pick your seats and things like that it might ask you for those codes or when you go up to the terminal it might ask for it as well so this is known as a booking code but the fancy name is a pnr now what you might not know is let's say i could get your pnr i know you're flying somewhere i know your last name and i get your pnr how do i get your pnr well you're carrying around, it's on, it's probably on your luggage tags, right? If I'm standing behind you in a line at Tim Hortons at the airport and you have a carry-on or something like that and you have a ticket for it, your confirmation code is probably right there, maybe your last name as well, okay? I'm standing behind you, I just open up Air Canada, the mobile app, I type in your last name, I type in your, your confirmation code and I can do all sorts of things, right? First off, it will probably tell me what your name is. It might give me your passport number because that's part of your account. Uh, I could cancel your account for credit, maybe try and send the money to my credit card. Um, I could see, oh, you, you, do, you don't have frequent flyers. I have a frequent flyer account. I'm just going to quickly like sneak my you know, Air Canada uh, account in. You probably won't notice because you're not collecting the points anyway. And so I'll just sit at, at the line at Starbucks and, and just do that to everyone that goes by uh, that doesn't have like a frequent flyer and I'll gain all of these points and things like that, okay? So this information should actually be a secret. It's more or less a password, okay? But often we don't know, we're not told really by the airlines to treat it like a password and people don't realize like the damage that can be done if someone would, you know, with ill intentions was able to get uh, that particular code. Oh, and, and you don't, you know, to make all these changes too, you can just do it through a website, right? You don't have to, you don't have to go up to a human and talk to them. You just, you know, you can do it from your phone uh, with, with a web interface. Um, so, like, why do they rely on the PNR, you mean? Yeah. So, like, the, it's just, it's, it's easy enough. Uh, to do so it's it's a balance between usability and security so they the airlines probably feel like not enough people are attacked this way for us to care um and the uh uh from a usability perspective it's simple right you can just type it in um six characters in a last name or whatever yeah and so it should be more but this this is the same with everything everything's like this like do you do you want a website to ask you 20 questions about who you are and your address and where you last flew and everything like that just to log in, people get frustrated with it, right? So it's always hard to strike this balance and it's, and it's hard for a website to tell whether you are actually the person you're saying you are, right? So these are all difficult things and lots and lots of people have, uh, 
lots of people have problems with this uh, kind of, like a lot of services have problems by underestimating how easy it is to impersonate other people. The other thing too about it is it's not fully random. So even if I don't know, but I kind of know roughly like when you're flying, maybe what airline, there's a lot of structure in that code too. So I could just try to exhaustively search it. And it's not, it's not a full six characters of entropy at all. Uh, like a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of structure in that code as well. Yeah, yeah. So if it were random, then it would be harder to exhaustively search. Uh, like the website would probably lock you out before you would be able to guess it. Uh, but here you could maybe get a couple, like 10 good guesses in before you get locked out and you might hit up on that. Yeah. Uh, really it was uh, something like an idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Another thing about this, though, too, is like, so whenever you talk about a back end system, this is important, uh, like whose back end system, right? And so this number that was given to me is not, it's not an Air Canada number, right? Yeah. It's like, it's for every airline, the whole airport, everything like that, right? Yeah, so these are like kind of, this is like a back-end system almost for the country, but even multiple countries will use the same structured codes and things like that. So it's really an international like kind of standard around this code. Yeah. Like this article is probably in Britain, the Guardian's in, in the UK. So like, and they have the same code more or less as, as we have in Canada. Okay, so let's say we're able to get our ticket. So that's good. Uh, now what? So we have our code, we have our ticket, we have an email receipt, we paid for it. Okay, yeah, so we're going to go to the airport, right? And what's the first thing that we're going to do? Okay, check in, uh, or maybe we do it before uh, from our phone or whatever. Okay, so check in could be, yeah, one of two ways. You could use one of these kiosks, actually three ways, I guess. You could use a kiosk, you could talk to a human, uh, or you can just do it from your phone. So um, what's the goal of checking in? What would you end up with at the end of check-in that you didn't have before? Okay, so yeah, so you have your boarding pass, uh, which has your seat number. Usually, sometimes they, they'll assign it later, but usually your seat selection. Uh, and then also if you're checking bags, this is also where you'll get the, the tags or whatever to put out, or they'll put the tags on for you on it. Um, now, when you check in, does anyone check your ID? Do they look at your passport? and say, is it actually you? So the answer is sort of on the screen, but, but yeah. So the answer is it depends, actually. So if you go up to a human, they're going to check. They'll be like, give me your passport, and then they'll check it, OK? Uh, if you go to a kiosk, usually you'll scan the passport, but they don't necessarily. Sometimes I've seen it where they take a picture of you or something like that, and they try and match whether the photo on the passport matches your actual face. But usually they just scan it. So. Let's say I'm traveling with all my kids, then I'll just scan all of their passports. They don't have to be standing there. So it's me scanning on someone else's behalf. Um, and then if you do it online, no one's checking anything. OK? So if I had a ticket in someone else's name and I had their passport, at this point, no one knows that I'm not that person. OK, just something to keep in mind. OK. Um, now, let's say you're on this no-fly list. So let's go back to this no-fly list. Then what happens? OK. so. Maybe you already know it because when you try to book your ticket, they don't allow it. Uh, I don't know, the, the, the rules around no fly are kind of like obscure, like, like the government doesn't talk uh, like inside about what their policy is inside and out. Um, but based on like news articles and things like that, uh, it seems that uh, for most people, they don't realize it till they're at the airport. Okay, so they're at the airport and then, uh, then what they'll do is they'll try and do it online and it will say, It'll just say something vague, like, oh, you have to check in in person. Or there was some issue with your th account, we can't check you in automatically, like go, go to see a person kind of thing. So then you'll go to the person, uh, they'll look at your passport, uh, in this case, and do an ID check. And then they'll say, oh, sorry, you can't fly, you're on, on this no-fly list. Okay, then back to the earlier question, okay, is it no-fly list a list of names? Is it names and biometrics? Is it names and passport numbers? If two people have the same name and the other person's on the no-fly list, does that mean you're on the no-fly list? Obviously, it'd be kind of stupid to do it just by name, 
right? Because there's lots of people that have the same name. You'd want some more specific information than that. But um, what happens almost, it's always in the news, like usually the new the news gets bored with articles like this but usually every year they there's i pick up the newspaper and i see something like that um so this uh boy is 10 years old and he's on the no-fly list is he a terrorist probably not right why is he on the no-fly list so his name matches a, a someone that is on the no-fly list okay and so it literally is just based on name and this particular kid i think the, the occasion of this article is like, this is his third time flying and he's been denied. So every year, he or not every year, but he'll fly and then they'll say, you're not allowed to. Then they'll say it's a mistake, right? And then he'll be allowed to fly. But then the next time they go back and try and fly, then he's again, he's on the no fly and they don't let him fly. And so it's becoming this whole like kind of hassle. And so there's even like a, a lobbyist group that's trying to get some laws changed about it. Um, but anyways, we don't, and, and there's lots of, you know, children are an obvious case because it's pretty obvious that, like, say you have a six-month-year-old, they're, they're not the terrorists that you're looking for, right? That's pretty obvious. Now, you could have two adults, right? Then it becomes a dispute. Maybe they are the terrorists and they're not saying it, right? And so those cases are, are less clear-cut, right? You, you have to first decide who's innocent and who's not before you decide whether there's something wrong with the policy. But when it's kids, it's, it's obvious that there's something wrong with the policy, right? It's not... It's not that these, these little kids are, are terrorists. Um, and so, uh, anyway, so, so there's a lot of, like, secrecy around the no-fly list. No one knows exactly. You can't just say, you can't go read it. You can't look at it. You can't know whether you're on it until there's actually a problem uh, when you're at an airport. Uh, if you are on it, it's not even clear what you do. Like, who do you go to? How do you get off it? Uh, people will just sue the government. And then they'll, they'll say, and then that's sort of, now I think there's maybe more procedures in place where you can actually go directly to um, CTSA or, or whoever it, whoever's jurisdiction it falls under and, and, and try and uh, dispute it. Uh, but anyways, it, it leads to delays and you can't fly the same day. It might get sorted out in a month or two, uh, that type of thing. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, this was also another news article that, that I saw in The Guardian. Uh, it talks about this two-scan. Uh, so the quote from the article is, Canada, Canada uses two-scan, a uh, vast repository of at least 680,000 names, 40% of which have no recognized terrorist group affiliation. Uh, and then this is the nice little bit from a policy perspective. Um, let's say a law enforcement agent or say an intelligence agent or someone like that, they want to add a name to the list. They're doing an investigation, they decide someone's a terrorist, so they want to make sure they can't fly, so they'll add it to um, the list. So law enforcement have that ability. Um, so if you want to add a name to the list, you just fill out a form, okay? But if you want to take a name off, like you're like, oh, I, I made a mistake actually, or my investigation went a little further now and I realized that that person isn't. Um, even if you added an error, you need a lengthy court process, uh, and it's rarely been successful to get a name off, okay? So it's basically a list that only grows in one direction, right? It gets bigger. There's additions to it, but there's never any removals uh, from it. And then because uh, in Canada specifically, this, is, this particular list is managed by the U.S., Canada subscribes to it. Um, but then Canada can't, they have no jurisdiction over the list as well. So if Canada says, oh, we vetted this person, they shouldn't be on the list, you made a mistake, the U.S. can just be like, forget it. Like, we're, just to be safe, we'll keep the name on the list anyways. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so anyway, so maybe you're on the no-fly list, maybe you're not. Okay. Now, let's say you're not on the no-fly list. Then the other main deliverable is your luggage tag, and your uh, boarding pass, okay? So your boarding pass uh, might look like this. Um, so there's, there's a couple of things that are, are sort of interesting on it, I guess. Um, so your name is going to be on the boarding pass. Uh, that code that we talked about, that six-digit six digit code will be on your boarding pass as well. So if, if you're just holding it, like say you're waiting in security, you have it in your hand, anyone can look at it and see the code. Um, so keep that in mind. Then there's other little pieces of information um, so there's this TSA pre, this is a U.S. example, but does anyone know what that is? Pre-check. So what this does is it basically allows you to go to a shorter security line, 
So when you line up at the metal detectors, there's a bunch of different lines. And if you have Nexus or Global Entry or TSA PreCheck, those kinds of things, then you're able to go to one line uh, and then everyone else uh, waits in the like sort of commoner line. Um, and then boarding group, what's this? Exactly, yeah, yeah. So uh, when you show up to the plane, eventually they'll be like, okay, we're boarding group one, all those people get on the plane, then boarding group two, then boarding group three. Part of that is to fill the plane from front to back. Uh, it just makes it easier. Why do you not want to be in the last boarding group? Is there any reason? Is there any disadvantage to being the last on the plane? Okay, so yeah, you're not going to have space to put your luggage or whatever, right? So generally people want to be earlier. Usually if you have like like say you're flying business or something like that, you'll get in the earlier groups. Uh, sometimes if you have a kid or a baby or a stroller or something like that, they'll, they'll board first and things like that. So generally people want to board, they, you want to be in a higher boarding group as opposed to a lower one. Okay, so the boarding pass encodes your name, your PNR, uh, information about your flight, other stuff, uh, priority at security, uh, priority when you're boarding. Okay, now, what kind of security is on this boarding pass? Okay, so there's a car, QR code barcode thing. Okay, so let's say I wanted to, I got put in boarding group six. That sucks. I'd rather go in boarding group one, make sure I get overhead luggage. So I just print out a boarding pass and I put a one instead of a six. Is that going to be a problem? Am I going to get caught? Okay, so he's going to scan it and check it. Now, let's say I have a barcode reader. So I, I read the barcode, and I see that somewhere in there there's a data field, and it says boarding group 6. And so I change the 6 to a 1 on the front of the boarding pass, but I also change in the barcode too. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. So I could try and change the seat number as well, or there's a mismatch between the boarding group and the seat number, so that all of that is true. And then there's also the option of, well, what if it's signed, or I know it's not a cryptography class, but there's things like Macs and signatures and things like that that would stop you. You could change it, but it will just, the signature will break. I don't know the private key, so I can't create it uh, signed, okay? Signatures make a lot of sense. So do you think this is signed or not? Okay, what are the arguments? If you had to guess, you're gonna get $100 whether you're right or wrong. No, are, you, are you guessing it's signed or not signed? Okay, okay. So let me uh, take your point and break it into three, the world into three possible worlds. Okay? World one is that information is encoded in the barcode. There's no fancy encoding, it's just base 64. Any barcode reader would parse it out, it would look like English string, uh, and there's no encryption. Okay? World two could be that they use some custom encoding. Right, so that when you scan it, it just looks like garbly goop, like kind of like a binary, like a compiled file or something, and you don't really know how to decode it. And then world three is that you actually have cryptography on top. So it, it's not just reverse engineering the code, you'd have to break the cryptography. Breaking the cryptography means getting a key that you don't know that's huge, like too big to guess kind of thing, okay? Now, let me tell you that the middle world is not true, okay? So usually people don't mess around with custom encodings because A, it's hard to do. When you take crypto, they'll tell you that's, we call it security through obscurity, and it's not really security. If I can get like 10 different barcodes and know the differences between them and then scan them all and then look and see how the, the data changes, I can reverse engineer the coding. So generally you don't wanna ever do that. It's kind of like consider rolling your own crypto. So, Let's say the middle road is out. So either you're going to do true cryptography 
And in that case, if it's in plain text, it doesn't matter because it's being protected by the key, right? So it's either protected by a key or it's not protected by a key, okay? So who's saying, for $100, who's saying it's not protected? And for $100, who's saying it is protected? Okay, and can anyone give me, if you say it doesn't, is there anything, could you just look at this and, and say, I actually have a pretty reasonable reason why it wouldn't be protected? Most of the data is written in plain text. And yeah, so again, we're only talking about integrity. So remember in SSL, you have confidentiality. Can you read it? And then there's integrity, which is can you change it, right? So in this case, all I'm proposing to you is its integrity. There's no confidentiality. Obviously, the, the data is there already, okay? So it's just about whether if I change the data, is it going to break a signature? So it's just an integrity thing. I don't expect anyone to know the answer. I'm just curious if, if someone would no, know about uh, it. Uh, but. Usually, when they got it, these guys, they love the system. They're not concerned about security. They're concerned about usability. Right. Just to do it. OK. So usually, a, a good as a security person, it's usually best to just assume that there is no security, because most people just want to get it done. right? But then there's two things. There's two reasons why it's unlikely that there's security by looking at this, okay? The first is the size of the barcode, okay? I don't expect you to know this, but could you fit a digital signature in a barcode that looks about that size? The answer is no. A signature is way bigger uh, than that, okay? So that, that would be the first tip off, is that there's probably not a signature there. Uh, that barcode does not look, it's not even a QR code. Uh, there's, there's no way there's enough data uh, there to hold a signature uh, itself. Um, the second thing is, whenever you have signatures, you have keys. So now you have to figure out, okay, who is it that has the key? Who's signing this thing? You know, if I get it on my mobile phone, like who signed it? If I get it from a kiosk, who signed it? If I get it from a human, who signed it? Do they all share the same key? I mean, if every kiosk has the same key, that's pretty, I compromise one kiosk, I get the key, right? And then you can think about the flip in terms of verifying signatures, you also need a key, right? So how do, how does, Air Canada know the public key of Air Transat, right? Now you need PKI, right? And we're back to that whole SSL problem of like, how do you know whose public key belongs to who and things like that, okay? So that's probably why there's no crypto here, okay? It's just that PKI would be such a mess uh, to try and manage and people are losing keys and revoking them and things like that. It's hard enough for the web, they're probably not doing it in airlines, okay? Um, then if you actually decode it, you can see that there's no crypto. Okay, so you can go, you can decode it. You'll see that you can actually decode it, like it makes sense, uh, the data there, and there's no field uh, for encryption, okay? Then the true test you could do is actually try it. So go to the airline, try and change it, and see what happens, right? Um, and so, uh, uh, okay, so this is just sort of some slides about why. So PKI is hard, uh, the signature's too big. Um, I thought I had it. Uh, okay, so, so there's an article, sorry, um, these slides are a little weird. There's an article on Moodle, uh, and I think I refer to it a little later because I use a lot of examples from it. Uh, it's from the security guy named Bruce Schneier, uh, and he writes a lot of like books about security and things like that, and he has a particular interest in airport security. And so uh, he'll do it with a journalist. He'll get a journalist and say, okay, let's fly together. And then he'll go home, they'll get the boarding pass, he'll print off a fake boarding pass. He'll give them priority status even though they don't have it. He'll change the boarding group and he's able to get on the plane, no problem, okay? You, when you start changing names and things like that, that's where things get a little more complicated. We'll circle back to that later. But a lot of this stuff that like, you might have that's sort of optional, you can just change it and uh, nobody notices and there's no signatures or max or anything like that. Okay, so we have our boarding pass. What, what do we do now? So I went to the kiosk, I have my boarding pass, it's in my hand, where am I going next? Okay, before security, one thing. Okay, luggage, okay, so I'm gonna drop my luggage off. Is there any security involved in luggage? What? Okay, okay, so there's that type of thing as well, but uh, just think about the luggage itself for now. So I have like a suitcase and I don't want to take it on the plane. I want them to store it and then when I land it comes off the plane. 
Then we'll go through those security line and they'll start checking things. But it's true that, that for the luggage, they might check your boarding pass and things like that. Um, so that's, that's fine. So they'll do some sort of ID check. Make sure it's your luggage and not someone else's uh, that you're dropping off. The luggage will get tagged with your name and your number. Um, do, do they ever look at the luggage? Like it kind of disappears on a conveyor belt. You never see it until you land. Like what happens between point A and point B? Okay, okay. Uh, the right, right, right. Okay, so there's a set of illicit things that you can't fly with. There's a list that you can put in your check baggage. It's different than what you can carry onto a plane. So carrying on a plane is, is more prohibitive. Okay, so the answer is that absolutely baggage is looked at. Okay, so normally it's tagged. Uh, the name of the passenger that's put on that luggage, they're legally responsible for that bag. So if you're flying with someone else and you put, if you mix the tags up or whatever, uh, you're responsible if your name's on it. Um, and we don't know exactly what happens behind the scenes, but there have been some like, sometimes the media will get access or there'll be a reality show or something like that and they'll show it. And so they have these inspection stations. They look kind of like what you go through anyways uh, for security. They do things like x-rays, uh, they have like animals like dogs and stuff that will smell it maybe chemical swabs like that that kind of stuff uh manual inspection as well uh so they'll open uh the bags up and they'll look for it and there's two things that they're looking for um so one of them is there are two broad categories i should say of things that they're looking for one of them is anything that could compromise the safety of the train or of the plane sorry so this would be like your terrorism related things, like is there a bomb in the bag, that, that kind of thing. And then the other one is uh, for border services. So if you're going across a border, you might be flying domestically, but if you're going across a border, then there's a bunch of stuff you can't bring across a border, okay? And so that's, the, the sort of priorities of the two organizations are slightly different, but everyone's going to screen uh, for everything else. Yeah. Okay, okay, a few more minutes. Okay, now can you put a lock on your luggage? Yeah. yeah. Okay, anything about the lock? What happens if they want to look in the bag and there's a lock? They break the, they break the lock. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, so you can put a lock on your bag. If they want to look in your bag, they're going to break the lock. Then you'll get your bag without a lock. Now that's expensive. People want locks because they don't want people other than TSA looking or stealing stuff out of their bags. Um, so the TSA said, we have this brilliant idea. We're going to have this special lock. It's called TSA approved. And there's going to be two keys. We'll give you one key that will open the lock. And then every TSA agent will have a master key. And that master key will open all of these locks as well. So then they can, they can unlock your bag. They can search it. Then they can put the lock back in place. Uh, usually they put like an indication that they searched it. Uh, and then they, uh, then it's locked again. Then when it comes off the conveyor belt and is going around, if someone else is standing around, they can't just open your bag and, and look at what's in it or, or take things out of it, okay? Um, now this sounds like a really good idea, okay? Is there anything that could go wrong? Okay, okay. So what happens if the TSA master key gets leaked, right? Now all these locks are useless. It's basically like not having a lock at all, okay? How hard would it be to leak a TSA key? Who would you have to compromise in order to get one of these keys? Okay, so any agent that's back there has this key. How many are there? And the manufacturers as well, okay? So you... So you have, uh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so there's like 50,000 TSA agents that might have, I don't know how many of these would have access to this key, but it only takes one to leak it. All the manufacturers of the lock, they also have to have, to have a copy of the key in order to make the lock so that it's compliant. And so there's a lot of copies of this circulating. Once it's leaked once, right, 
then it breaks all the locks. Now you could try to renew the lock. You could come out with a new one, but then it, again, if it leaks once, then all of those locks are, are gone. Plus everyone who bought a lock before the refresh, it still, doesn't, it still doesn't work kind of thing as well, okay? So from a security perspective, we call this key escrow. So this is like the idea that there's a master key, only law enforcement access has access to it. You see this idea show up in all sorts of debates around cryptography, including like encrypted messaging and things like that. So every now and then the government will say, you shouldn't be allowed to do end-to-end -end encryption. We should have an escrowed key with law enforcement. So anytime you think of that or hear that kind of debate, think about this example, because this is a real life example. And it always is the same problem. One person leaks the key, then the whole system breaks. Another example of key escrow would be, um, I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, videos, if you watched a movie, instead of streaming it, you used to get a CD, right? Like a DVD. Uh, and there was like Blu-ray and uh, what was the other one called? Sorry? DVD. There was DVD. Yeah, so there was DVD first, then there was two competing ones. Do you remember? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I should say that. Yeah, so this key leaked and you can literally, you can buy it off Amazon for a couple dollars or you can 3D print it. If you have a 3D printer, you can just get it and print it yourself. So very easy to obtain. Um, but anyways, these movies were also the same thing. Like there was encryption on it so that you can copy the movie and give it to your friend. But every DVD uh, player had to have the decryption key in it, like hardware DVD player. Then when DVDs became software, then every copy of the software has to have it somewhere in it. It's hidden in the binary. So someone does reverse analysis, they find it, and then it breaks every DVD. So DVD encryption got broken almost right away. With Bluetooth, they had this like technology to revoke keys, but they never ended up using it because it was too onerous. Okay. Uh, We'll, we'll go for a break in a second and I'll actually fix this. Um, okay, let me, let me just get through this stage and then, and then we'll break. Um, this is just another example of that sort of key escrow idea that if you, uh, if you entrust 10,000 people with a secret, right, it's gonna leak more or less. So this, was, this isn't about airport security specifically, it's just about intelligence in general. Um, but anyway, there was this intelligence operation, but I'll just read the quote. Uh, there's increasing evidence that the leak was not an intelligent operation by a state actor aiming to discredit the US, but more likely the consequence of a Pentagon policy of granting top secret security clearances to huge numbers of service members, civilians, and contractors. contractors. Uh, the number of employees and contractors in the entire US government with top secret clearance is about 1.25 million. So if you, you're like, oh, that's top secret. By the way, a million people have access to it. What's the chances that one of them is bad and is going to leak it? It's going to leak, right? You can't trust a million people with a secret. Daddy, I did it. Good job. OK, then the other thing I want to note is that uh, let's say you're, you're in the flight and, I don't know, you left something in your luggage or something like that. Can you just go down to your luggage and pull it out? And so the answer is no, it maybe depends on the airline itself, uh, but generally speaking, the bags are physically isolated, okay? So they're loaded off the side of the plane outside. There's no way for you to actually access it. So if someone smuggled something through their check baggage, they wanted to gain access once they were on the plane, they basically couldn't do it, okay? So the rules are kind of more lax about, that's why you can have liquids over uh, you know, 100 milliliters or whatever it is uh, in your check baggage uh, because you're never going to get access to your check baggage when you're in, in the plane itself. Okay, so just to recap, we've purchased the ticket, got our boarding pass, we dropped our bags off. Now we're, what's, what are we doing next? We're going to go through the actual security that the thing that you think of when you think of security of airports is security. There's actually one thing that happens before security. Anyone know? Anyone remember? Okay, so let's say you've done that after that before. 
Okay, so there's usually someone that stands at the front of the line. They're going to scan your boarding pass. Uh, they might look at your passport in the U.S. Uh, in uh, Canada, they don't. Um, and then you'll actually go to security itself. So this is called pre-screening. Okay, what's what's the purpose of pre-screening? Why do they scan your barcode or your your boarding pass? Why do they do it at the start of the line instead of the end? Okay, so they might be looking at who they're traveling with. Oh, I see, I see. But do they check your passport? So let's say I have a boarding pass that's someone else's name. It's not me. Are they going to catch that or not? Right, so the answer is no in Canada. In the U.S. they will because they check your passport at that stage. But in Canada they don't. So it's not about identity per se. Okay, so part of it's just straight up logistical. So logistical would be, are you in the right security line? Are you going to end up at the gate? Are, like, are you on an international and the internationals are over there? Part of it's about time stamping when you join the line uh, so that if you don't make the flight because the line's long, then they know, well, they're sort of, they're stuck in security line or they sort of know where you are. Um, they, uh, or they know you were super late for your flight, you showed up five minutes before too bad, we're leaving without you. Um, so part of it's just about sort of tracking people as they go through the airport so you sort of know uh, where people are. Uh, part of it could be which security line you go to. So there were the fast lines like Nexus and pre-TSA, so they might direct you one way or another. Um, so anyway, so there's, yeah, so a, a bunch of logistical stuff. Is there any security at all? So we already said the boarding pass could be faked. They don't check your ID. It's mostly just directing you and, and making sure you're going to the right place and what time and that type of thing. Is there any security that happens at pre-screening? So there wasn't thought to be any security. Uh, and then uh, there was a, a newspaper or media article uh, organization called The Intercept and they got a leaked TSA uh, document that said, actually these people, they're, they're more than what they look at, like. Uh, what they're actually doing is they're trying to look at your behavior and trying to decide whether there's anything suspicious about you. Uh, and if they spot something, then you could get redirected uh, to law enforcement. So we'll get there in a second. So the first person, or the first question I guess is who, who actually scans it? So there's different, there's different organizations that are uh, involved. Uh, is this Air Canada that's scanning it? So it's not because the security lines for every, every airline, right? Um, so in Canada, it's called the CATSA, or in uh, the US, it's just called the TSA. And the main job of the TSA is to prevent, to provide safety over the flight itself, okay? So they're looking for anything that would harm the safety of the flight itself. They don't, there's a bunch of stuff they don't care about in particular, right? Like they don't care about if you have drugs on you, uh, they don't care if you, uh, have illegal money or too much money or uh, whether you have fake passports. I, I don't know. There's a bunch of stuff that border control will care about. Okay, so they're a different set of people. Uh, but these people, and the, obviously they see something illegal, they're going to report it. Okay, uh, but that's not their particular uh, job. So in Canada, there's no ID check. Uh, there's logistics uh, to track your movement through airport delays. And then uh, the other reason is this screening uh, that happens. Um, so there's an article about this. There's uh, um, on the Moodle, there's the actual document itself. And uh, I'm going to, because the slide's a little small, I'm going to try and open up the document itself so I can just show it to you. Actually, I'll just grab it on Moodle. So this program is called Spot. It's kind of interesting. We, we talked about social engineering and sort of the psychology of, a little bit in, into the psychology of, of how people behave under deception and things like that. Okay, so the way this system works is they basically are gonna, they're trained to look for certain indicators. If you exhibit one of these indicators, they give you points. If you get enough points, you get either sent to secondary screening, which means they'll do a manual search, or they might do it in a side room, they might go through your luggage and things like that. 
uh, or if it's severe enough, you'll get sent directly to the police, uh, which is called LEO, uh, which stands for Law Enforcement Officer. Uh, so the points down here, you can see, you, you can get up to three points and you'll still be allowed to, to proceed. If you get four to five points, you'll go to secondary screening. And if you get uh, five or more, uh, then you'll, or six or more rather, uh, you'll get secondary screening plus uh, they'll, they'll refer you to law enforcement. Okay, so what are these indicators of someone who might be being deceptive? Um, so things like arrives late for flight, avoids eye contact with security personnel, uh, excessive fidgeting, you're looking at your watch, you're shuffling, you're shaking your leg, your face flushes, your eyes blink fast, uh, <coughs> the veins in your neck are protruding, uh, you have strong body odor. Uh, uh, so anyway, these are things to remember, right? Remember when you're going through. Yes, exactly. Okay, these are uh, two, two points each. Um, so bag is heavy, you have a cold penetrating stare. Uh, you're looking around. This is something I have to be careful of because when I go through the airports, I'm always looking around because I know I'm going to give this lecture. Um, uh, improper attire for location, so if you're flying like to the Caribbean and you're wearing a snowsuit, that kind of thing. Um, and then these ones are really bad. Um, so you appear to be in a disguise, you start asking security questions, uh, they tell you to do stuff, you don't do it. You're sort of like secretly signaling to someone else uh, that's going through the line and things like that. Then if, let's say you get a bunch of points, but you have your family with you, then they'll take two points off. Or if you're married or, or have a partner uh, and uh, they're, you're over 55 years old, uh, then they'll take two points off. And you're also deemed low risk if you're a female over 55 years or you're male over 65 years. Uh, then, this is just, sorry, the first part, part of it. Whoops, sorry, the, uh, when I scroll over it, misinterprets it as going backwards. So there's things that you shouldn't fly with. So like, we all know like the stuff you shouldn't fly with, but in addition to it, there's things that like look suspicious that are, are not like necessarily illegal to fly with. So like a lot of like almanacs or blueprints, uh, a GPS unit, uh, if you have any kind of like military gear, uh, liquids or gels, we know. If you have like a lot of prepaid calling cards or phone cards, that looks suspicious. If you have like a whole bunch of pictures of, I don't know, the White House in the US or something like that. Um, if you have things like rope, duct tape, batteries, electronics, that kind of stuff. And then these are signs of deception and they're kind of the same as, uh, there's deception factors here. Uh, so I don't know why, but they, they have a separate section for it. And a lot of the stuff is kind of the same, but. Sorry, I'm struggling to keep this on the screen. Shoot. Okay, maybe I won't zoom in. <coughs> uh, so changes in voice pitch uh, covers your mouth when you're speaking. You delay your responses when you're asked questions. Uh, you yawn a lot and it's exaggerated uh, or you clear your throat a lot. Uh, your face is flush, you're blinking fast, you give non-answers. Uh, there was one like if, if it <coughs> looks like you shaved recently, that was another one, I, I, I don't see it here, but it's somewhere here. Uh, whistling during the screening process, so don't, don't ever whistle uh, when you go through. <coughs> and then there's a bunch of stuff that are like really bad that automatically get you uh, notified to law enforcement. Um, so there's, it sort of clusters of behavior, so there's no definition of it. But if, if you have firearms or things like that, or you have fake passports and um, large sums of money, those kinds of things, then you'll just automatically get referred to the police. <clears throat> okay, what do we think of this list? Does it look good, bad, better than nothing? Okay, anyone think it's great? No? Anyone think? Um, 
Okay. Uh, so this was the response of an actual psychologist who said it. Um, so she said, uh, this was in a testimony to uh, Parliament about this particular, or not Parliament, but the House of Commons, or what do they call it in the US? Uh, Congress, there, there it is. Um, okay, humans do barely better than 50% chance in trying to guess whether someone's being deceptive. So that's even like trained people. So if you train someone, like lie detector tests and those kinds of things, they're not admissible in court because they're basically, they're not reliable at all. Um, there's no great variations in individual's ability to detect deception. Uh, what that means is that like, if I have no training and you have a lot of training, we're not going to be able to do much better. So training isn't going to help you. There aren't like super spotters. There was a whole TV show, I forget what it was called, uh, that was premised on this idea that someone could tell like whether people were being deceived or deception or not. Um, and uh, does anyone know the name of that show? I forget. It was like a pretty popular show. Uh, anyways, uh, it'll come back to me in a sec. But um, uh, uh, okay, so suppose experts such as cops and custom agents are no better than anyone else. There's few, if any, reliable cues to deception, and people frequently misread signs of stress, nervousness, and discomfort as indicating lies. Okay, so if you go back through that list and think about, well, maybe the person's stressed because they're in an airport and they're about to miss their flight, right? They could exhibit all sorts of signs, like sweating and flushed face and uh, like not really paying attention. You're answer asking questions and they're not really giving you good answers and things like that. So another way to ask this is, how many terrorists do you think this caught? So they did implement this program. They ran it for, for a couple months. We have some data on it. Um, so, uh, by the way, it costs $900 million to do all the training and come up with the whole thing. And so one set of data is they ran, this is in 2007, so it's a little old, but they ran this program for five weeks. Uh, 429 people got, ref they, they got enough points to get referred to secondary screening. And then 47 of the 429 were actually referred to law enforcement. So that's where the police uh, stepped in. Uh, the police looked at uh, the 47 people. They only made 16 arrests. Okay, so we're talking about thousands and thousands of people, and 16 people got arrested in the very end. That's not that that abnormal because, like, if it's trying to catch terrorism or whatever, there's going to be a small number of, of people. Um, but but anyways, it's 0.01 percent of people are arrested. How many of them were terrorists? Zero. Okay, it didn't catch a single terrorist. Uh, 14, it was some illegal immigration or they didn't, they were undocumented. They didn't have the right documentation. Uh, one was arrested because they were intoxicated and one was arrested uh, because they had drug uh, on them or, or they had paraphernalia of, of drugs on them and zero terrorists. Okay. So was this a successful program? Not for its intended purposes. Okay. And people criticized it and said, the real reason you're doing this is because you want to catch illegal immigrants. You're calling it like anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism, but your real agenda is, is catching illegal immigrants. Okay, so we made it past that person. Now we're finally at security itself, okay? Um, so we're at the security screening. Okay, so who's doing security screening? Again, this is CA, TSA, or TSA in the US. Um, what do they do in terms of ID check? I mean, the answer is there. Do they, do they look at your passport? Okay, they don't. Uh, they'll look at your boarding pass. Again, they'll scan it. Probably, again, it's just logistical. It's sort of like when you start at the line, they scan your boarding pass. When you get to security, then they scan it. Now the system sort of knows that you're through security, or in, in a few minutes, you'll be through security. Um, and so, yeah, that, that will make decisions about whether they hold a plane uh, waiting for you or that type of thing. Okay, when did you show your ID, by the way? We, we made it through security now. Uh, we didn't show the passport to security. Did we show it when we got our boarding pass? Not if we did our phone. Did we show it when we dropped off our luggage? Well, we might not have dropped off our luggage. We might not have luggage. Did the person at the front of the line check it? No, they only looked at the boarding pass. Did I have to show it when I booked my ticket? No, I did that online. Okay, so just note that like, basically if you're flying under a fake name, at this point, you're through, like, 
you've made it all the way through all of these layers and no one's checked it yet. Now in the US it's different, so they do check it before, they check your boarding pass and your passport and they make sure they line up before you board the plane, okay? Because they see that as, as a risk that we shouldn't let people get all the way to basically boarding the flight before we notice that they're trying to fly under a bad name. And the person doing that check is an airline employee, not a TSA agent. But, but anyways, we'll, we'll get there in a sec. Okay, so they, they're going to scan your boarding pass but not check your ID. Then you'll go through security itself. What does security itself look like? Like what, what do you actually do? Like what, what does it consist of? Okay, scanner, so what, what's a scanner? So a metal, metal detector, is there anything else? Is it only metal detectors? Has anyone ever seen or seen any other kind of thing that's used? Okay, okay, so they'll do like a baggage check. They, they might do a pat down. Okay, so there's a pat down of your body. Um, there's the metal detector. There's two kinds of detectors. So one is actually a metal detector. It just detects metal. And then the other is like an x-ray machine. It's the one where you stand up like this and then it like scans around. Uh, and it, it's actually taking an x-ray that's like a millimeter deep or something like that. Um, so those are called, uh, actually the name, I forgot it, uh, body scanners or something like that. Um, there's also a privacy consideration with body, sorry, with these body scanners as well. Because you basically see someone naked when you look at the actual image that's produced. And so what they do, this is another policy procedure they have is usually in Canada or the US, is the person looking at the monitor is in a completely separate room and they can't see you as a person. So the, you can't see both the person and what they actually look like and see their nudie scan as, as people call them. Um, and so anyways, that's, that's sort of like a privacy feature of it. You can opt out of it. So you can say, I don't want that scan. That's your right. And then they'll do a manual pat down and then, and then that's it. Okay, so we have two kinds of scans. We have a manual scan. Is there anything else? So there's at least two other things I can think of. Okay, one thing uh, that's happened is sometimes you'll go through the scanner and then they'll pull you aside and they have this like um, little discs, uh, like cotton discs, and they have a big stick and they kind of rub it on you. Uh, and then they put it in a machine and say you're good to go or not good to go. What's, what's the purpose of that? Okay, so it's a chemical swab, basically. So they're swabbing all your belongings. They're looking for residues of certain chemicals. It's not actually drugs, probably. I think it's more bombs. So it's like any kind of like gunpowder, like uh, bomb making material and things like that. Uh, that's, that's what they're looking for. And then there's one other thing that, um, one of the weirdest ones I had is, I was, it was in the US somewhere. You don't see this in Canada so much, but we were all waiting in line. And then they made everyone stand against the wall put their bag in front of them. And then they came around with dogs. And then the dogs like, just they just ran. The dog ran through and then it was done. And then they're like, oh, guess what guys? You can now go to the fast line uh, because like you, because no dog smelt anything. So what are the dogs smelling for? Again, uh, explosives, uh, it could be narcotics and, and drugs as well. Okay, so there's your metal detector. You have your, uh, your body scan, uh, physical pat down. Um, inspection of your bag baggage itself, manual inspection, uh, animals, and then the chemical uh, swap things. Okay, what can't you fly with? Uh, so this is the list, this is the official list from Transport Canada. Um, so guns, firearms, uh, devices that could stun someone, uh, sharp objects, uh, just in general tools that could injure someone or threaten the safety of the aircraft, blunt objects, uh, any kind of explosive, uh, liquids, aerosols, and gels. And so the rule in Canada is uh, if it's measured by volume, it's got to be under 100 milliliters per bottle. And additionally, all of them have to fit in a one liter Ziploc bag. Okay, so you can't bring 1,000 100 millimeter bottles. Okay, so there's an upper limit on it. And then if it's measured by weight, it has to be 100 grams. Um, then there's things like acids, compressed gases, uh, that type of thing. And like some organic uh, materials as well are, are either restricted or they're limited uh, in terms of size. Okay, so let's zoom in on the, the liquid thing. First off, why can't you take 200? I have a deodorant stick and it's 200 milliliters instead of 100. Why can't I, why can't I have that on the plane? Okay, 
So the main target here is liquid explosives. So a lot of explosives are more powerful in liquid format. Uh, you don't necessarily need a lot of, of a liquid uh, in order to, to make a bomb that's big enough to threaten either the safety of other passengers or the plane itself. Um, does that mean you can never take anything over 100 milliliters? I mean, it says so, but just to be clear. Is there exemptions? Okay. Okay, so maybe if you have a doctor's note or something like that, maybe. Do you know that for a fact or you're guessing? Okay, so there's medical stuff and things like that. But let's say you're not, you're not that person, you don't have uh, any medical issues, you don't have a doctor note, then is there anything else that you could bring? Okay, so the answer is actually there's quite a few things that you can bring. Uh, so one thing that I've done uh, traveling with kids is if you have breast milk or formula, you're actually allowed to bring as much of it as you want. Okay, so... Uh, uh, so the the, um, uh, the rule is here, other than formula, milk, breast milk, juice, or food for infants, then, it, then the rule actually applies. So that's the sort of fine print uh, with the rule itself. Okay, so we've gone through with lots of stuff. Now, if you're a terrorist, right, what do you do? You build your liquid bomb and you hide it in breast milk. Okay, now if you go through with breast milk and no baby, they're probably not going to let you through, right? Uh, and so, anyway, so it's maybe not the best option uh, if you're a tourist, but still this, there is this exemption. Is there anything else that would be even easier to go through with? So it turns out there is. Uh, so for some reason, I don't know why, but if you wear contact lenses, you get this like lens fluid cleaner, and they usually come in these like obscenely big bottles, right? And so for some reason, those things, because I guess it's hard to get a small bottle of it, saline solution, you're allowed to travel with as much as you want. So the Bruce Schneier, the guy, the security guy who faked the boarding passes and for the news article, he also demonstrated this. So he took the journalists through security and then he opened, the, they opened his bag and he pulled out a bottle of lens, uh, contact lens fluid. I forget what it was, but it might be like 500 milliliters or something like way over the limit. And he's like, I'm allowed to fly with this, right? And they're like, yep, yeah, it's fine. And then he pulled out another one and they said, oh, why, why do you have two bottles? He said, well, I have two eyes. <laughs> and then they let him go uh, with, with both of them. So this article is kind of fun. It's called The Things He Carried. And it shows all sorts of stuff that he's carried through security uh, before. And so um, anyways, he was, he was allowed to, to keep the two bottles. So it's 24 ounces in total. OK, so is this good or bad? Obviously bad, right? Like there's, do you think a terrorist would know about the exemption to the rule of anyone in the world? Yeah, of course, they study this stuff like carefully, right? And so if there's an easy way to do it, what are they going to do? Is it actually like restricting? So then the question is, well, why do you do it at all? Right, why bother with all the security stuff if you can just put your bomb in, in contact lens fluid and then, and then go through no problem? Right? And so the answer seems to be that a lot of it is what we call theater. Actually, Bruce Schneider calls th security theater. It's meant to like, sort of make you feel good about flying, make you feel safe about flying. And it's not necessarily like the most effective uh, things. And a lot of it's reactionary. Like someone does a liquid bomb, then we limit the amount of liquids. Right? Someone puts a bomb in a shoe, what do we do? Okay, we, we all take our shoes off, right? Uh, so there's a picture of someone taking their shoe off, right? Uh, someone puts a bomb in a laptop. What do we do? We all pull our laptop out of the bag. We put it in a separate bin. And then if they want to check whether it's a bomb or a laptop, they'll turn it on. And that's their test. Now, could you put like a little, I don't know, Arduino chip in a laptop that would be enough to just turn on the screen and make it look like it turns on and then still have lots of space left over for your bomb? Yeah, of course. Right? So again, it's just sort of, uh, as, as Bruce Schneider says, we defend against what the terrorists did last week. So it's not really about preventing terrorism, it's just about sort of keeping people happy and placated. Uh, this was the actual shoe bomb uh, that, that somebody tried to fly with. Uh, they were trying to ignite their shoe, and a passenger thought it was weird, so they alerted the people on the plane, and then they subdued the person, and so they didn't... The person wasn't successful in, in lighting their shoe bomb. Uh, but then now, as a result, you know, millions of people are taking their shoes off every time we go through airport security. OK. Yeah.
Yes, yes and no. So yeah, so everything has like levels of scrutiny, right? So at first they'll just look at the bottle and if it doesn't raise alarm, it might go through. But if they're suspicious about it, then they'll pull it aside. They'll pull you into secondary screening. Once you're in sec secondary screening, there's no time. Like you're going to miss your flight. Like they, they could keep you there a day. They could keep you there an hour. Uh, they have a lot of power. Uh, like you don't have a lot of legal rights. You're not allowed to have a lawyer. Uh, if you have passcodes on your phone, they're allowed to, to, to unlock them and things like that. Um, but then that's where they might take the, the, the actual chemical itself. And they might, uh, if they have a reasonable suspicion, then they can, they can test it. Uh, they might hold you until they wait for the results. They might release you. But then if the results came back positive, then they would go and arrest you or put out a warrant for your arrest. So it probably depends on the circumstances and how much evidence they have. But, but yeah, they, they could... In the long run, they could actually test it. Yep. So everything is suspicious if they decide. Like it's it's based purely on human discretion, right? And so. They, they might ask you why, why, why is your phone reformatted or something like that, and you can tell them whatever they, wherever you want, and yeah, every, everything's just based on, it's a human investigator, and they're sitting there, and they don't have rules about if you see this, you must do that, it's just, it's all based on the contacts and what other evidence do they have, and what are their other suspicions based on. So that was the only thing that was suspicious about you, probably wouldn't be a big deal, but if it's one of ten things that are suspicious, then it might it might add to the pile of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so now we're through security. Uh, what's next? Okay, so immigration is actually a good one. So in Canada, if I'm flying to the U.S., I'll go do immigration next, and then sometimes you'll land and do immigration at the end. For the purposes of the slide, let's do immigration next. So we go through customs. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, so customs uh, only applies to international travel. Obviously, if you're flying within Canada, from Canada, uh, then you won't go through customs at all. You don't even need a passport. You can fly with a driver's license. Um, uh, and if you're flying somewhere like from Canada to the U.S. where lots of people fly, then the U.S. will put people, like when you go through U.S. customs, it's Americans, like they're American agents in Montreal. Uh, and technically, when you're in that room, you're sort of like on U.S. soil uh, as, as far as your rights go. Um, and so they'll sit there and, and they'll be the ones that uh, question you. Um, and then a lot of other countries, like if you go to Europe or something like that, or the Carib Caribbean or like lots of places, uh, then you land and they'll do customs after. Um, so the custom people will look at everything. They want to see your ID for sure. That's the most important thing. Uh, they usually... They might not always ask about your flight details. I think they probably call it up on the computer screen and it tells them, but they might ask to see your boarding pass or something like that. Um, this is where like your visa issues and immigration status and all that stuff will be. So whatever documents you have related to whether you're legally allowed to enter the country uh, will be checked at this particular case. Now, these people are different. So this is the border services. They're not the same people that did security. So they're different, they're both government, but they're different agencies, they have different goals. So the agency that does security, they're worried about whether you're going to blow up the plane or attack people. And these people are worried about what are you bringing into the country, are you allowed to be here, are you coming to work, even though you're not allowed to work, like those, those kinds of things. Um, they do consider terrorism, they consider all crimes, but it's not the main consideration. Uh, they, they also look at, so large amounts of cash, uh, controlled substances like drugs, uh, weapons, uh, food items as well. So there's a lot of food items that are, there's nothing wrong with the food, uh, but what they don't want is they don't want you to bring food from another country that might have pests or like insects or things like that. Then it gets introduced into say Canada, into the ecosystem. Um, so that's why a lot of food items are prohibited. Um, there's a great show, a reality show called uh, Border Security. Uh, and it's actually these people uh, so it's like a reality show. So they usually show three or four cases. And there's lots of examples of people like just, 
they're coming home, like, or sorry, they're coming back to Canada from their home. They're bringing a lot of food uh, with them. They don't know the rules, and then, but then they're getting all the food confiscated and, and things like that. Um, not everything's prohibited. So sometimes you can bring stuff, uh, but you just have to declare it. So you have to say when you're going through, I'm bringing this. You might have to pay duty uh, if it's a certain amount of money, uh, that type of thing. Um, if you're detained at the border, as mentioned, uh, they can pull you into question. They can detain you uh, indefinitely. Uh, you don't have the right to a lawyer. Uh, they can look through all of your stuff. And if you watch this reality show, it's actually interesting. So people will come and they'll try and lie. They'll be like, oh, I'm... I'm coming for tourism, but they really have a job like lined up. So they're coming to work. Okay, so that's not allowed. Um, so what they'll do is they'll be like, okay, give me your phone. And they'll, they'll start going through their emails and like emailing it. And then they'll say, oh, what's this email to this person about? And they'll, it looks kind of like you're discussing work. And they'll be like, oh, no, that's nothing, whatever. And they'll be like, okay, I'm going to call them. So then they'll go to the other room and they'll literally call the person. And they'll be like, I have this person. They're staying at the border. Can you tell me like what you're expecting when they come and like they, they they investigate it fully okay so it's not just like a cursory glance like if they if they want to go to that level of investigating they they'll read everything they'll read emails they'll call people anyone that's in your phone they'll just call numbers they'll talk to them they'll ask them about you and, and things like that so it's a, a full-fledged uh investigation um and then uh uh i should say actually you might have the right to a lawyer i think it sort of depends uh depends on it uh, and you also have the option, basically, once you make it to customs and you present yourself, you're kind of stuck there defending what, if you said something wrong, you're stuck there defending. Um, but sometimes they'll give you the option of just leaving. So they'll say, okay, we're going to pretend you never tried to enter Canada. You can just take a flight back and uh, we're not going to mark it. Well, they probably mark it on your file anyways, but um, there's that type of thing. Or there's like, we're going to arrest you or we're going to ban you from the country block you from the country and things like that. So there's different levels of, of repercussions if, if you try and cross a border that you're not supposed to. Okay, so we made it through customs. Then what's, what's the final step? Okay, we're gonna get on the plane itself. Uh, and so is there any security check here? So they do scan your barcode, or sorry, your boarding pass. What else do they look at? Your passport. So this might actually be, if you don't go through customs, you're flying domestically, you're in Canada, you do everything online that you can do online, this might be the, the first time you ever have to pull out your passport and show it to someone, okay? Is, uh, and is this, is this border agents? Is this CTSA? Who's, who's sitting at the gate? Okay. okay, so this is Air Canada or something like that. So they're not even security people or law enforcement. Okay, so more or less it looks like this. You have your boarding pass, they scan it. Uh, you have the ID. They're gonna match the ID to your face. They're gonna look your boarding pass up, the details in their database. So let's say you make up a flight or you don't actually have a seat or you gave yourself the wrong seat, then they'll catch that, okay? That's the kind of thing that would be a mismatch between what's uh, in the boarding pass details and what's actually in their database. Uh, and then they can also deny you uh, uh, flying. Okay, so as mentioned a few times, this could be the only time your ID and boarding pass are actually checked together. Does the name match the name on the boarding pass? Does the face on the passport match the face of the person that's standing in front of me? Um, if you're flying domestically, uh, you can any photo ID is fine. It doesn't have to be a passport. If you're flying internationally, it has to be a, a passport. Um, and in some countries, including the U.S. until the, the 90s or 2000s, uh, they actually didn't check IDs for domestic flights. Uh, and so they would just let you on with the boarding pass. And if they do that, it's a big problem because basically no one's ever checked your, uh, both your boarding pass and your identity. In the U.S., they do do it because they do it at that pre-screening step, okay? So that now is the only step where the two pieces of information are, are checked together. So there was one person, uh, a security researcher named Chris Segoyan, and he picked up on that last part. The fact that in some countries there's no ID check for domestic flights. And he actually is probably the reason why there is now. Um, so what he realized is that in order to make sure someone's allowed to fly, you basically have to check three pieces of information together. Okay, You have to check their ID, you have to check their porting pass, and then you have to check that they're not on the no-fly list. 
okay? And so when you check in, the fact of whether you're on the no-fly list or not uh, is attached to your boarding pass, okay? So you're either issued the boarding pass or you're not. So those two pieces of information are checked together. Assuming you're able to get a boarding pass, the assumption from that point forward is that you're not on the no-fly list. Otherwise, you wouldn't have this boarding pass, okay? So no one else is going to check the no-fly list from that point forward, okay? Um, at step four in the process of, I, we numbered them as we go through, but anyways, at that pre-screening step in the US, they might check your ID and your boarding pass, okay? At that point, it's sufficient. Now they know that you aren't on the no-fly list, okay? Um, and then when you board the flight, they're going to check, I should maybe say the ID check and the boarding pass, but they might, they might check the no-fly list as well. Okay, now let's say that, uh, for example, um, they don't check your ID uh, when you board the flight itself, okay? So there's a pre-screening and they check whether your boarding pass matches your identity. And uh, when you board the flight, they check whether the boarding pass is affiliated with being on the no-fly list, okay? But no one checks all, piece, all three pieces of information together, okay? Then what the security researcher realized is you could actually have two boarding passes Okay, so you could take that boarding pass and split it into two, okay? One boarding pass, boarding pass one, is a real flight, but it's not the person who's traveling. It's someone else that's traveling, okay? And that person's not on a no-fly list, so it's a neighbor or something like that. So I, I'm on the no-fly list, I book a flight in my neighbor's name, I get the real boarding pass. The only problem is I don't have a passport for that person, okay? So what I do is I create a second boarding pass, the second boarding pass is real in the sense that it matches my name and I have a passport for my name because it's me. The only problem with the second boarding pass, what makes it fake, is that there's no flight. That person's not on the flight, okay? Now the problem is that because CTSA does the first check, they don't have Air Canada's database. So they just say, here's a person, I see their face, I see their passport, I see their boarding pass. It's all consistent with each other. Okay, they wouldn't have gotten a boarding pass if if they were on the no fly list. Right. So that's what they check. They let the person through. But because there's no security on boarding passes, there's no signature on it. Then that boarding pass could be completely fake. Then later, when you get on the flight, they're going to say uh, they'll look at your boarding pass. If they don't check your ID at that stage. Right. Then they'll just look at your boarding pass. It's actually real. They'll see that you got it because you weren't on the no-fly list, but if they're not checking your ID, then you could be a completely different person, okay? So in other words, there's a way to sort of thread the needle uh, using two different identities, okay? So this is an example of a grand example of a policy failure, okay? Because people didn't sit down and realize like what's being checked at all steps and who has access to what and this person's checking this and this other person's checking this. Uh, there was a way, a loophole in the policy where you could get through. So anyway, so someone pointed this out, Chris Seguin. Uh, he wrote a paper about it. Um, he also had a website where you could fake a boarding pass. So it was just like a little web tool. You could type whatever information you wanted. It would create a boarding pass with the QR code or the 2D or the 1D barcode. And then it would uh, print it out. And then uh, next thing you know, that his door got knocked down by the FBI. Uh, they took all his computers and servers away and things like that. And then he eventually was exonerated. So like doing the boarding pass thing wasn't a crime and pointing out that there's a flaw in the security of airline security is also not a crime, but it was a lot of like legal headache uh, for him uh, to go through. And then he became like a very strong like advocate for like security and privacy rights. Yeah, yeah, so there's another attack too if you can fake your ID as well. So another way to like thread this needle would be with a fake, if you had like a fake passport or something like that, or like you say, if you're doing it domestically, you just have a fake driver's license. Driver's license are, are like, I guess maybe relatively easy to fake, especially since the person, yeah, I, I don't know, like if you assume the pre-screening person's a trained professional, there is TSA. The, the airline official at the very end, right before you board the flight, they're not trained, probably. So you could probably get by with a fake ID with the first person, sorry, the second person, but maybe the first person you would get caught. Um, 
but but anyways, it, it definitely is easier to fake a driver's license than a passport. And it's still possible to fake a passport as well. It's just, it's more a question of money. Right, yeah. Anyways, and then, uh, so then the TSA changed this rule as a direct, probably as a direct consequence of, of this being pointed out. So now everyone checks your flights, uh, checks your ID when you board the flight. Okay, so what are some high level lessons from all of this kind of policy stuff? So some of them I drew from this paper and some of them I, I just sort of added myself. Okay, so a couple of challenges. These are reasons why policies are hard. They're hard to get right. So things that make them hard are uh, when your security goal is split across multiple people. So you need the cooperation. So the airline's a good example. You have the airlines themselves. You have espionage that's maintaining the no-fly list. You have the TSA, CATSA that's looking for terrorism. You have CBSA that's looking for illegal immigration, work permits, uh, that type of stuff, drugs. Uh, you have law enforcement as well. And so each one has a different role. They're all checking a piece of the puzzle, but there's no one person that's checking the entire uh, kind of puzzle. Doesn't mean you can't do it, right? But you just need overlapping checks uh, between it. Um, another thing that's not really an airport security thing, but it's just a sort of general point, is uh, if you look at like the academic research, which I spend a lot of time on as an academic, um, the more technically sophisticated an attack is, the more attention it gets, right? So if I break, I don't know, Intel SGX, and it's super technical, and it's really you know deep programming, like hardware, like kind of programming hack, Kind of thing that gets a lot of attention there's lots of papers about it uh everyone hears about it it's on the news and that type of thing uh but if you just break a policy like amazon's policy or something like that and realize that if i add a credit card number like people don't write papers about it right there's not a lot of attention uh that's given to it and so it's one of these things that kind of flies under the radar okay so adversaries use it and there's not a lot of good defenses or methodologies for defending against it because it doesn't get attention and it doesn't get attention because people are like, that's simple. It's just about humans. And does the human let you do that? Yes or no? Like, what? you can't write a paper about that, right? Write a paper about hardware or, or software or cryptography or something like that. So there's not a lot of research uh, that, that's done in this particular area. Um, so, so what can we do? So one thing we can do is we can try and audit all of our policies. So that's fine. That's necessary but not sufficient. Uh, but again, it's just someone like a human looking through your policies trying to see what they could spot or, or not spot. Um, you also, yeah, it's very time consuming depending on how big your policies are. Uh, and then um, the other problem with an audit is that it, let's say you pass an audit, that's great for you and your policy, but you can't really reuse that work for someone else in their policy. It's sort of like every policy you have to start from scratch. So that's why it ends up being not just a lot of work to do one audit, but across, let's say you're trying to audit a thousand things, you almost have to do them independently. You can't like kind of reuse pieces of your first audit in your, in your second or third audit. Uh, another thing that's proposed in the paper is that um, you have like bug bounties for policy errors. So if you come up and, and you go to Air Canada and say you have a, a policy error, then you, it's reported the same way that you would report a software bug. Uh, there's maybe a CVE style thing that's attributed to it. There might be money uh, that you bake Here's by doing that. Regulation is another thing that you can do. <clears throat> if you determine a policy is bad, you know how to fix it. And it's just that the people don't want to fix it. Like the Postal Service, for example, they're not fixing this like mail forwarding thing. Then the government can step in and say, sorry, you have to fix it. So that's essentially what regulation is. So like uh, this SIM swapping, uh, the FC FCC, which is uh, in the US, it's the sort of the equivalent of the CRTC in Canada. They kind of govern airwaves and radio and, and things like that. They also do a lot of internet stuff. Um, they basically stepped in and said, we're going to make some rules for telecoms to follow whenever someone wants to swap their SIM. <clears throat> you have whistleblowing or going to the media. So if you see one of these flaws and no one's taking it seriously, the company's not fixing it. 
lawmakers don't want to fix it, then you can write a cover page for Wired Magazine, like at, like Matt Honan did, and then all of a sudden everyone knows about it, and then Amazon is going to fix it, um, that type of thing. Uh, another thing you might think about is formal methods. So formal methods would be like you turn the policy into logic. So you make it so that a human can, or sorry, a computer can understand it, okay? Uh, so you make it like into like code almost, okay? And then what you can do is then you can formally, you can throw logic at it and you can logically prove that there's no way onto the flight with all of these rules, you know, if you don't, if you have the wrong ID or something like that. So you can, you could actually prove that these properties are, are, are true or they're logically consistent. Uh, but what you'd have to do is you'd have to turn human policies into like symbols and rules like X does Y and, and all these types of things in order to do it. Um, yeah, so if, if policies are, are uh, harder to analyze than code is to analyze, then you can turn policy into the code. Then, you know, we know how to do static analysis. We know how to do model checking and things like that. Uh, so we can do it with policies as well. Um, the problem with it is you might miss something when you're modeling it, right? So when you write down all the rules, you might miss a rule or you might miscode it or something like that. Then the model says it's fine. And it's true that the model's fine, but the model doesn't match what people do in real life. Or sometimes it depends on who you get on the other end of the, of the phone line. So you call customer service, they're supposed to follow a rule, but sometimes they make exemptions or things like that. So that's hard to like put into your model. Another risk of this is that, again, it's sort of the same problem as an external audit. If I do formal methods on my policy and you do it on yours, we're both like, I'm spending a thousand hours on mine and you're going to spend the same thousand hours on yours. You can't, just because I did it once, you can't sort of take what I did and then make it, it doesn't make your life easier or quicker uh, to, to do it for yourself. So you can't reuse this. So everyone's sort of doing it for themselves from scratch. And so it ends up being expensive for that reason. Okay, that's actually it. So uh, any final questions? All right. Good. All right, I'll see you all next week.